So I'm here to talk about hardware mostly, right? Not Spectrum. Most of the clients in, in Rip and Replace are uh, certainly wireless, third, second and third tier wireless carriers, but it's all about the hardware in their network, and particularly the, the Huawei and ZTE. This program has a number of names. It's you know secure and trusted. I'll go back one more. Secure and trusted, uh, uh, you know, secure and trusted Networks Act, secure and trusted Communications Network Reimbursement Program. People refer to it as supply chain SCRP, and but everybody just calls it rip and replace. So or sometimes Huawei rip and replace. So next slide, if you would. A little about us. So I know a lot of you don't, don't really know who we are. Dave Wiley and I are with, of course, Widelity. We do a number of different, you know, our, our really our DNA is telecom. So we do in-building solutions, network and IT operations, compliance regulatory, web and field test services, technology strategy. If it comes to tech, you know, telecom and airwaves, we pretty much do something with it for a lot of different clients. But uh, I'm particularly going to talk about uh, our, our uh, compliance and regulatory group. Next slide, if you would. Why us? Um, you know, we were very active in the broadcast repack, which some of you uh, know. We wrote the report and catalog for the FCC of the costs and the challenges that the broadcasters were, were going to face. Um, we are now currently working on the, a number of different programs, Innovation Fund, BEAD, Middle Mile, Save Our Stages. Um, uh, you know, kind of, you know, minority communities reconnect, IIJ funding support. So we've got we've got a lot of clients we're helping there with their federal requests, which is really one of our specialties. So we do grant qualification, write the grants, invoicing and reimbursement support, and then of course reporting. Um, in supply chain, this is what we're going to focus on today. Rip and replace. Uh, many of you know, and if you all know this, I'll just bypass it. But basically. There were $5.6 billion in requests from about 100 different applicants. And the FCC was only authorized in the legislation for about $1.9 billion that was funded. So as uh, Michael Taggart, who touched base, you know, what mentioned yesterday, there's basically a $3, million, $3 billion gap in the funding. And this is causing quite a bit of trauma among all the folks who need to get that Huawei and ZTE equipment out of the network. Depending on who you believe, well, there's no question, at least from, from the U.S. perspective, it is a huge security threat, and it really is a strategic effort to get that all removed, and I'll talk a bit about more about that. So um, Michael Taggart mentioned that it's possible there will be some, fun there's lots of funding moving. It's a bipartisan support. Things were close last year to get fully funded. Now there's still additional opportunities in either omnibus funding, there's uh, S1245 working its way through the Senate. So there's lots of opportunity, and uh, uh, we just keep our fingers crossed that there will be funding. So you know, these are massive efforts. You know, so far in the last three or four years, we processed 100. Oh, can you give me the next one. Sorry. Yep. We processed like 150,000 documents for our broadcasters and the 22 uh, telecom clients we're working with. So it's huge. We've dealt with 7,000 requests from the FCC for additional information, basically clarifications of what our clients are asking for. We've got 90 consultants spread across the country working on these federal programs. A lot of it's just paper processing. Um, we did the 450 TV stations. That sort of has, has passed. That, that is closed now. We've got them $400 million. And right now, we're working on 2.5 billion, uh, well, 2.1 billion requests for a total of 2.5 for, for the rip and replace. The numbers are massive, and, and, and the uh, uh, you know, requirements to just manage all the requests uh, are, are just very large. Um, as I mentioned, you know, funding was 1.8. It's now $3 billion short for the 96 applicants. Um, the FCC prioritized the applicants into three basic buckets. Priority one, which was the original request for telecoms that were under 2 million subs. And they sought 4.6 billion. This was this is directly from the, the recent letter from Chairwoman Rosenworcel, uh, updating Congress and the Senate um, about what, you know, where they stand right now. So of the uh, 5.6 billion that was that was finally approved for the uh, uh, telecoms under two uh, two million subs, they're only going to receive basically 40 percent of their dollars currently because they had to prorate 
and that's 40% of the money that they need to spend to pull the Huawei and ZTE equipment. So this is causing quite a bit of trauma politically and operationally for these groups. They're still committed to pull the, pull the, uh, the funding, but it's not at all sure to them yet that they will have everything they need. There was a priority two applicant um, that were uh, you know, uh, non-commercial non entities, uh, nonprofits, and so on. Uh, nobody applied, or I think a couple people may have applied, but none of them were approved. So there really is no priority two applicants. And there's one applicant, it's public, it's Lumen, uh, with between two and 10 million subs. And until the full funding, they were receiving no, no money. So it's really all about the smaller rural telecoms. And to be clear, this isn't Verizon, it's not T-Mobile, it's not AT&T. They were all smart, we were talking about, they were all smart enough, they did not put any of the Huawei and CT equipment in, in, into their networks. Actually, you know, one of them had a small amount, and they just realized that was an issue and took it out. So this is all third tier applicants. So this is Alaska, Montana, Nebraska, uh, you know, the small co-ops that under uh, financial pressure shows Huawei because it was, or CTE because it was cheaper and it was good equipment. And that uh, those issues are, are, are now uh, not coming back to, to, to harm them. Um, right now, the uh, applicants, all applicants, must submit one invoice for reimbursement. It's kind of an odd you know, requirement, but by July 15th, coming up now. And once they get reimbursed for that, probably 60 days afterwards, a clock starts. And they will have one year to complete their, their bills. Now many of them have started already. Some are even close to getting finished because they just realized they had to do it, or as close as they can. Many are also um, pulling out all their Huawei and ZTE equipment and replacing it with the equipment as best as they can and just leaving some areas unserviced. So the key is to get it out can't afford yet or don't have the relationships with the Nokia's and Ericsson's uh, to fund the replacement equipment. So some trauma is out, happening out there. Um, uh, you know, and uh, you know, so far, 52 of the 126 applicants, this is from uh, Chairwoman Rosen, Russell's letter, have gotten distributions. So the clock is starting. So now one year from July, probably one year from July 15th, probably 30 plus 30 to 40 days um, is, is when it starts. Now, uh, there's a general expectation, and historically, most of these folks are very close to the FCC, and the FCC has been very reasonable about extensions. They do have the ability to offer extensions, and for folks who are working hard at it, you know, people hope there will be extensions so that they're not able to build within one year, or they're facing uh, significant issues with delivery or whether there will be an understanding, but there's no guarantees yet, and you can't count on it. So, um, so um, part of what we've been seeing with our, our groups, just to fill you in, um, you know, what, what are you seeing from our clients? Thank you, sorry. Um, you know, the supply chain issues, for the supply chain, if you will, but just the actual issues of getting a hold of equipment are very real. There are significant delivery delays for purchasing this equipment. Uh, chips were is easing a bit, but chips were a major issue, as well as interesting things like all the materials for, I'm sure there's a better word for it, but the green boards, you know, we're having, people were having problems with that, so if they could get chips, they still couldn't get boards. I've had discussions with some folks in our clients, you know, and some of our big major suppliers who are saying, this is weird, I'm way, this is way below my level, I mean, I'm way too high for this to be talking about having to get screws for cabinets. But, we're not, right, you know, it's happening. Some strange stuff is happening out there just for the ability to deliver the equipment. You know, right, we're laughing, it's true. Um, uh, uh, you know, staffing concerns. We just heard about, you know, train, you know, training, I think everybody's talking about staffing. A lot of people are now looking for the same set of tower crews and installers out in locations. I see some head nods. Um, you know, a lot of groups are installing 5G, dishes out there upgrading, everybody is busy building. Uh, and it is an issue for staffing and finding the right talent, particularly since they are in relatively rural and very rural areas. Uh, so staffing is, is a major concern. Um, again, I mentioned again again, the funding is, is impacting timelines. People just are not able to buy the replacement equipment or relying on the goodwill of, of mostly Nokia and Ericsson, a little bit of Samsung, some Mamineer. Um, 
that goodwill eventually starts to run out because they don't have the money to buy all the equipment. So everybody's kind of working together, but it, everybody's fingers are crossed that there will be a funding solution. Um, whether it's shipping delays, folks that are, there are people requiring uh, replacement in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Alaska, uh, American Samoa, and for a lot of them, shipping is a major issue. In some cases in Alaska and rural Alaska, you only have one window to get something in and one window to get something out. So if you miss your spring shipping of your, your, uh, uh, you know, your, your equipment, um, you know, containers, uh, you, you miss the window. So you have to wait a year. So everybody's really focused on, on what needs to be done in terms of shipping. Uh, and then weather is always, always a case for those of you who have dealt with it, or the broadcasters, uh, you know, hurricanes. Um, so next slide, second one. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so far, I think you all know, I mean, the key vendors uh, are Ericsson and Nokia for Open RAN. Mavenir is very active in there, and there's some Samsung in the region. So they are mostly the suppliers of the replacement equipment. Um, many people have faced issues that the requirements for the budgets and quotes and reconciliation uh, is a massive effort. And there can be tens of thousands, you've all done bills of materials for a whole network, I, I assume, or have seen them, you know, tens of thousands of lines. And there's always a requirement, there's, there's a requirement, rightfully so, that your estimates and your quotes all align. And because of issues in and around inflation and delivery and delivery delay, day, delays and some vendors are now quoting things only for 30 to 60 days, quoting deliveries six months to a year out, and then requoting when, when things are delivered requires a fair amount of uh, analysis and work to comply with the FCC requirements to get everything aligned. Everything has to be aligned with what you're requesting, what you're getting, and what you're reporting. Um, you know, again, this, this policy decisions are seriously impacting the ability of the community to deliver what, what we all think from a security perspective needs to be done. So, uh, you know, the delay of the 60%, the, the which everybody believes will come, and the bipartisan effort. Nobody's 100% uh, uh, sure what that will be and when it will be and in what, what form. Um, some of you may be interested in Open RAN solutions. Um, so far, Open RAN is certainly on the horizon. Most of the folks we have been dealing with, and most of the sort of industry, are not going with Open RAN solutions. Um, some are testing it. Um, a couple of them are using, you know, beginning to install Open RAN, and their experience is a little bit rough to get started, but it seems to be working pretty well for them. You know, um, so it's just uh, clearly it's a trend that's coming, and people are beginning to, to utilize it above and beyond sort of the testing situations. So that's kind of it for me as an overview. Um, I thought, you know, are there any questions? Or, yeah. So uh, Peter Young, ComSearch. Mm. Uh, I, I, the, the two questions really. Mm -hmm. Because there's such a limited supply of equipment, is are some of these prices this this three billion dollar gap because manufacturers are, and is it an, like a supply demand pricing issue? causing that. The second question is, where's all the old equipment going? Are we sending it to mm. uh, our mm. enemies? <laughs> ah, right. So, <laughs> okay, so, so, so far we have, we have not seen a huge, above and beyond the sort of the first effort when people put in their first estimates of about 1.8 billion to what was the 5.6 and then coming down to basically about five. Um, from there on out, we have not seen a huge increase in supply and demand, but there, there was the original upgrade. If the delays continue more than about six months, personal forecast is probably. Um, but also, you know, the, the first effort in the supply chain, the chips are now beginning to come out. People are beginning to deliver. So if, if I had a vision of, of the trouble curve, it was way high and the panic level was very high. It's now beginning to come down to a adult war. Major issues, I'm not saying it's not, but um, yeah. Uh, all the equipment pulled from any of the any of the equipment, which is the Huawei and ZTE, mostly. There's more on the list, but it, but most of the the rip and replace clients uh, customers uh, don't really have a lot of that video stuff. Uh, all of it has to be destroyed in an ITAR certified uh, facility. So all of it has to be tracked, shipped, 
<coughs> in a uh, secure system, of which Federal Express has them, UPS has them, all that kind of stuff. So everything is tracked to these facilities, and then the facilities then track all of the destruction by item. It's really quite an interesting thing. Uh, by item, and then there's video records, and then they will certify its total destruction and, where possible, the recycling of the materials. So, it, yeah, it's, it is not going anywhere. I just want to make a couple comments that Mike has been a tremendous leader within Widelity and has built an incredible team. And when we talk about doing stuff like this, it's sadly just the beginning. We, we have to get through this for national security purposes. It's an imperative. It's sad we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday, but it's, there's so much more that needs to be done. And it's kind of, it, and it's also exponential complexity for the phase and the processing of all this, some of which we have to work with the FCC and others to figure out how to simplify these things. But it does get complex, and their team, and Mike, I'm really impressed, and Mike wants to retire sometime within the next 20 years, so, <laughs> we, <laughs> so luckily we have some great leaders coming up behind him, but kudos to you, Mike, thank you. Yeah, and uh, two other questions that came up, oh, yeah. uh, uh, one is, you heard from Scott Blake Harris, China, other unfriendlies, he mentioned this. Uh, our, our folks from Energy and Commerce kind of me definitely mentioned this. Yeah. So this is presumably not the a standalone one-off program. Uh, and also, you might have heard yesterday about NIST declaring the quantum apocalypse. And what does that mean in terms of encryption needing to be either ripped and replaced or, or superimposed with unbreakable codes? And so I guess the, a few broad ranging questions that are very pertinent and we're trying to think strategically here also. What does it look like to design a good, you know, version 2.0 and 3.0, whether it's hardware and or encryption? You know, you guys yeah. were heavily involved in designing a lot of those solutions, right? So right. you well, might you might be real brain trust Guiding, here. guiding, how about guiding that? or guiding, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so you, you, there's there's a whole host of questions in there. Yeah. The question becomes, I think, in the limited definition of the telecom ran, you know, the wireless and wireline group, cable and wireless within the United States, in, including territories. The Huawei and ZTE is pretty, equipment is pretty well identified in that very carefully defined, you know, group of providers. Where else it is in the network, and where it might be in uh, in other networks, other applications, um, earth stations, a lot of different you know data centers. Uh, it's a good question, and not something I have worried about. Other than to know, I bet it's out there. Um, all those you know DWDMs and routers, you know, and so what is it? I don't know, but it is an interesting security question, and one I think that needs to be broadly addressed. Um, when it comes to security, it's an interesting problem because a lot of the folks who are in the rip and replace are rural telecom co-ops with a limited amount of technical expertise. And they are relying very heavily on their vendors to provide solutions. You know, they're, they're out there installing these things. Their mission is to make connectivity, not necessarily security, even though a lot of them are providing the cell service. You know, they're out in the rural areas in near Minot, North Dakota, and in you know the Panhandle. They're they're next to all these bases, uh, and so it is without question a major issue. Many of them are looking at 5G for the standard, but I think that is an interesting question, more more for Nokia and Ericsson. You know, and and, and also what you get also when you move more software defined with Open RAN, which I think is a really you know, strong opportunity. The software can be updated over time because you're now much less hardware defined and you're much more software defined and you can grow that capability. Oh. 